chapter 2. In our last look at the Gospel of Mark, we saw opposition of Jesus from the religious leaders. And there was opposition concerning the forgiveness when Jesus healed a paralyzed man and forgave him of his sins. There was opposition concerning fellowship when Jesus called Levi, the tax collector, said, follow me, and Levi left everything and followed Jesus. And then, as ridiculous as it sounds, there was opposition concerning fasting. And I think you understand probably why I say that one is ridiculous. To me, that one's the, they're really trying hard one to find Jesus doing something or saying something wrong. And so I call it ridiculous. But folks, it's going to ramp up now in the section that we're in this morning. At issue was that Jesus was a threat to the authority and power of the Pharisees. That will really come out this morning as we look at this section of the text. Jesus had become a problem for these guys. Jesus had now exposed their self-righteous pride. He was seen as a threat rather than as a blessing and and a fulfillment of everything that was prophesied in the Old Testament. We have seen the Pharisees' criticism of Jesus, and now we're going to see their conniving. At this point, the Pharisees look for opportunities to accuse him and even try to trap him into violating their regulations. Follow along with me, please, as I read Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 23 and through chapter 3 and verse 6. So Mark 22, beginning in verse 23. And I need to get there first. (laughs) All right, wrong chapter. Verse 23 of chapter 2. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread which is not lawful to eat except for the priests and also gave some to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was not made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And I read that wrong, excuse me. The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Verse 28. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. The growing tension between Jesus and the Pharisees serves as a context for what happens next. Now the issue becomes the Sabbath observance. And we will see some hostile interrogations that these Pharisees make. First of all, concerning eating on the Sabbath. Sabbath observance was a staple of Jewish culture. It was closely regulated and monitored by the Pharisees. But what's really sad about the Pharisees' accusation is that according to Deuteronomy 23, verse 25, there was nothing unlawful about what the disciples were doing, that they observed, that they watched. Moses had written... If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hand, but you must not 
put a sickle to his standing grain. The same was true in Deuteronomy 23 about grapes. Again, Moses says, You may eat your fill of grapes as many as you wish, but you shall not put any in your bag. This is all on the Sabbath day. The point was that they were not to do the work of harvesting on the Sabbath. Jesus' disciples were picking grain by hand, yet the Pharisees want to accuse them of doing the work of reaping and therefore violating the command that there are uh, six days for work and on the seventh they are to rest. The true violation of the Sabbath would be a capital crime deserving of capital punishment, and that would be stoning. Do you see what the Pharisees are working toward now? Do you understand where they're going? Jesus answered them with Scripture, and he said, have you never read what David did? Now, do you think they read what David did? Absolutely. Okay, let's remember who these are. These are scribes. They are experts of the Old Testament law. And they had copied uh, sections of Old Testament Scripture over and over and over by hand. Of course, they have read what David did. Jesus was referring to Scripture that we would find in 1 Samuel 21. And in that passage, David needed bread for his men and asked the priest to give it to them. This was the Sabbath day, and the bread there was for the priests. However, under the law of necessity and mercy, it was given to David. And Jesus is using that event to show the Pharisees that although they knew the Sabbath law, what David did was not in conflict with it. He was feeding hungry men. The Pharisees were so caught up in their interpretation of the law that they missed the whole point of the law. The Sabbath was not to be a day to restrict God's people or to burden them with a list of regulations nor was a Sabbath day to govern the, every detail of the behavior of a Jew on that day. It was meant to be a day of rest, a day of joy, a day of refreshment. And the commandment did not prevent people from picking grain or eating grapes on the Sabbath. Notice what Jesus said in conclusion of the matter in verse 27, which is the verse I got a little tongue-tied on. He said, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What is Jesus doing there? Jesus is putting the Sabbath back in its proper context that the Pharisees had taken out of context. Jesus had to restate the purpose of the Sabbath. God had given the Sabbath for man's benefit. It was a day of rest, one to focus on the work of God the Creator. But instead, a bunch of pious, self-righteous, self-professed Old Testament scholars created burdensome rules and regulations as to what should not be done on that day. They had actually destroyed the whole purpose of the Sabbath. The next thing that Jesus said most assuredly stunned the Pharisees. Look at verse 28. He says, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is rightfully taking back authority over the Sabbath. It was under His divine authority. He is the Holy One of God. And then they interrogate Him concerning healing on the Sabbath. Now notice that they watched him closely so that they might accuse him. The conflict escalated from questioning Jesus, from criticism as to what Jesus and the disciples were doing, to now conniving. Now they were watching every move that Jesus would do on the Sabbath. Can you kind of see them just 
sort of following him around and slightly behind maybe some of the crowds, just peering, just looking for Jesus to do something that would violate their regulations so that they could trip him up. And actually, so that they could accuse him of capital crime. Later, we will see that they even try to trip him up into doing what they saw as unlawful activity. And so they lie in wait to catch him doing what in their minds is unlawful. And in this event, Jesus being very consistent with his character, being very consistent what he has done since he began his public ministry, he is being compassionate to a handicapped man. And, and notice verse 4. He says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Jesus often answered people with questions. Right? Master teacher, Jesus is. Master teacher. Never ever a better teacher ever to walk the earth. And He used various kinds of ways of communicating truth, teaching truth, and confronting uh, error. And so he asked them this, this question. This question begged an answer. Right? That's what that question is. It's, it's begging an answer, but it's exposing the Pharisees' hypocrisy. And not only their hypocrisy, but their, uh, really, putting it into question, their real morals. I mean, would you not save a life on the Sabbath? Would you not do good on the Sabbath? Jesus' intention here is to do good to a man who suffered with a withered hand. And while Jesus was merciful to this poor suffering man, the so-called shepherds of Israel were indignant. And in their zeal to defend the minutia of their wrong-headed interpretation of the law, they lost all sense of decency. All sense of mercy. Now look at verse 5. And when He had looked around at them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Wow. Jesus was rightfully angry. Rightfully angry. But notice, at the same time, Jesus grieved over their hardness of their hearts. You know, folks, when we get angry, we usually sin. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I can see it in my life, you know probably 99 point whatever times a percent of the time I'm angry, I'm sinful. But we can get angry about things that are right. And Jesus is rightfully angry. But at the same time, Jesus is grieved in His heart at the hardness of the hearts of the Pharisees. Have you ever have those mixed emotions like that? I mean, we really understand the Lord's head and the Lord's heart as opposed to the, the head and the hearts of these Pharisees. And then there is the tragedy of verse 6. Look down at your Bibles at verse 6. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against Him how they might destroy Him. They left to plan how they might kill Jesus even to the point of plotting with those people that they despised. Because of the great crowds that followed Jesus, I think the Pharisees know that they're going to need help to stop Jesus. I mean, Jesus, now everywhere He goes, the whole town is there listening to Him. Well, the, the Herodians were a political party that supported, of course, Herod. They were people the Pharisees opposed. They would have opposed these people. 
but perhaps fueled with the knowledge that Herod had imprisoned John the Baptist for being a rival. Perhaps they can appeal to the Herodians that this Jesus likewise may be a rebel that could lead a revolt. And we just continue to see the hard-heartedness of these Pharisees. Now folks, that was the exegesis. And now the application. I think we could spend a good bit of time on the application with this passage. And I want to start with what I'm going to call the lesser application. And then move to the greater application. So for the lesser application, as Christians, obviously, we don't observe the Sabbath. Our day of observance is Sunday. And this is because this is the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's it's a time for Christians to meet and to worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. It's a special day of worship in the church. The Lord's Day, as it is called, became our Sabbath, if you will. We should understand that the Sabbath observance came out of God's work in creation. God worked for six days and He rested on the seventh. And that made its way, it was built into the law of Moses. As a creation ordinance, God intends for us to work and to have a day of rest. This day shifts from Saturday to Sunday. So we have a day to celebrate the resurrection of Christ, and I think it is a day of rest as well. Sunday is a day to demonstrate our gratitude to God and His Son for our salvific work and to enjoy its benefits. So Sunday has a specific purpose, right? It's it's not just another day. It's, It's not just another day of the weekend. It is a day that God Himself has ordained. And we need to focus on what we should do on this day. One thing is certain, it's a day to dedicate to the Lord. And I must say, it's the Lord's day. It is not the Lord's morning. It's the Lord's day. And shame on Christian churches across this country that slowly over about the last decade or so that have reduced it to the Lord's morning by canceling Sunday evening services. And having said that, what about attenders that reduce it to the Lord's morning? Now I realize that's a strong statement. And folks, I I don't mean that to offend. I, I hope it will challenge us though about Sunday about the Lord's Day. Now, I do understand that for good reason, some are not able to return for Sunday evening gathering of the church. I think of some of our seniors that don't go out and drive at night. They're not comfortable with doing that. Their eyesight. I'm starting to get old myself. (laughs) The doctor told me in my last eye doctor visit that I'm starting to get cataracts. And I I understand that there are good reasons for some to not be able to make it back on Sunday night. I understand those missing because of chronic illness. I should note that a lot of folks in that situation, they do watch our service online. I understand an occasional absence for proper cause from time to time. I understand for sure the Uh, absence of some that have occupations that make them work on part of Sunday. It's necessary. They're in service fields. They have to be available. In fact, my son is a police officer. That's his situation. Now, I'll say this. my, My son's family goes alone. They go, even though he does not. And then he joins them for the other Sunday service, depending on his shift. Now, I'm not saying that to lift my son up as some kind of example. I'm just saying that, that there's a way, folks. There is a way to remain faithful to the Lord's day. Uh, and for, for those that work on Sunday, that, that means a, a commitment to say, I'm going even though I'm tired. Even though I finished a shift or I'm about to start one after this service. 
How important is our gathering together? It is all important. I, I am simply addressing those who are only willing to give God the Sunday morning. And they might not say that, but their behavior sort of tells that. I'm, I'm, I'll give them the morning because the rest is for me. Some who are mourning only give what I call a nod to God and the rest of the day is for personal pleasure. The Lord's Day was never intended to be a quick early service and then the rest of the day is for me, my fleshly pursuits, my earthly pursuits. The Lord's Day is a day that is to be devoted to the things of the Lord. And of course, that means attending church where we study His Word, where we worship Him where we serve Him and others, and from time to time observe the ordinances of the church. Right? If, if, you're, if you're only coming to one hour, uh, that would also tell me that you're not doing an integral part uh, of uh, who you are as a Christian, and that is to minister and serve as well. Remember that God has given you a spiritual gift. And that is to be used to minister to others in the context of the local church. And this is why I've uh, used Sunday evenings to have a whole series on the life of the church. How important is the church? It is how God works in this age. And folks, I, I know that's strong. And uh, please understand, I don't scrutinize everyone that comes and I have a list anywhere in my office that these are Sunday morning only, these are Sunday morning, Sunday night, but these are those that come uh, to pray midweek. I, I, I'm not doing that. I'm just trying to challenge you to understand the importance of the Lord's Day and the importance of corporate worship. Um, the, the, this idea that, well, I can personally worship alone by myself at home. I do hope you have personal worship time. You're supposed to. But you are also supposed to be involved in corporate worship where you come with brothers and sisters in Christ and you fellowship with them around the Word of God and you minister to each other. And, and we, uh, we hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And we encourage one another to then go out and do the things that we learn and that we're taught in the Word of God. And now, having said that, I want to focus on where it should be, not on whatever should be forbidden on a Sunday. I'm not going to turn the Lord's Day into some kind of pharisaical thing. That, well, okay, Pastor Rob, I'll go because then I'll get you know, the good boy points with the Lord because now I'm going Sunday morning and Sunday night. That's silly, I understand, right? Um, the Lord's Day is, is something you should enjoy the fellowship with other believers uh, in the services of the church. And I would say take time for personal worship on that day. Well, I mean, what, what, what would you do between the services? How about personal worship? Uh, reading the Word, perhaps discussing it as a family, perhaps discussing uh, the morning service with the family, taking time also to enjoy the good things that God has given you. I'm not suggesting that Sunday afternoon it must be a nap. Although many of you love your naps. It's good. And it is, that is rest. But there are other ways to rest. Um, and so enjoying the good things that God has given to you uh, on a Sunday may be restful for you. I can some, think of some things that that I do from time to time between services uh, that is really rest for me. Uh, the Lord's Day is a good gift from God. Let's understand it uh, as that. But first and foremost, recognize the day is a day of celebration that flows out of the glorious redemption uh, that is ours in Christ Jesus. And with a grateful heart, devote that day to the worship of of God, and one in which there is also rest. Now, don't do this either. Don't um, come on the Lord's Day 
and then forget everything from Monday to Saturday and live like anybody else would live because worship is something that is a lifestyle. It's something we do every moment of every day. That's the lesser application. Here's the greater application. Hard-heartedness has been around for a long time, hasn't it? I think we can see it first in the Scriptures with Cain. Uh, we certainly see it uh, in Pharaoh of Egypt. You know, the, the Scripture just right out tells us that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Scary thing is, when you read that passage, at some point, it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Uh, Hard-heartedness is seen throughout Israel's history, isn't it? And it certainly lives on today. May we protect our hearts from such a damning condition. We need to understand its dangers. And so I'll move through these fairly quickly, but here's some of those dangers. Hard hearts lead to spiritual dullness and inability to see the truth. Right? The Pharisees. The Pharisees would not acknowledge the truth. They kept silent. Do you, you get those words there? What verse was that? Uh, where it says they kept silent. If you find it, shout it out to me. Verse 4, thank you. Uh, he asked them a question and they kept silent. Why are they silent? Because they're stuck. And they cannot acknowledge the truth. They would not acknowledge the truth. It is for this reason that Jesus, from this point on, will begin to use parables. And someone said this in the, the life group that I was in this morning. And they're absolutely right. For now on in our study, we're going to see a number of times where Jesus is speaking in, in parables. Uh, he is not going to cast pearls before swine. Folks, let us not harden our hearts. Secondly, it leads to spiritual denial. It actually leads to blindness. And at that point, the, the light is no longer available. It leads to spiritual death. Ultimately, this is unbelief. That came out in the life group I was in this morning as well. The Pharisees are what they are is because they have unbelief. And unbelief is a sin that leads to spiritual death. And then, of course, in this passage, we see it elicits God's grief and His wrath. The hardness of the Pharisees' hearts brought God's anger and grief. And the hardness of our hearts will do the same. When we continue in our sin... Our hearts grow callous and unfeeling. So how do you know that, Pastor Rob? I'll tell you how I know that. I've seen it in my own life. And by grace of God, He's pointed that out to me from time to time along my Christian life. That when, when I continue in sin, my heart grows callous and unfeeling. And I appeal to myself and to you to stop hardening our hearts by allowing uh, these sin to take hold in our lives. For the pious and the pharisaical, has the heart grown so cold that there is no pity for others? No concern for others? Have you become so convinced of a false spirituality that you spy out the faults of others? And I appeal to you to stop being a fault finder. Stop seeing the faults in everybody else's life. It's the heart of a Pharisee to be a critic, to find blame. Instead, learn to be hard on yourself and easy on others. May we not become self-righteous and hypocritical as individuals to the point that Trinity Baptist Church could become a self-righteous and hypocritical church. May it never be. That starts with me. 
May I make sure that in my life, I don't become pious or self-righteous and look at others as not measuring up to me. And that happens and we become to the point where we're that kind of church. May it never be. I trust that we can be a church that meets people where they are and help them grow rather than look down on them just because they may not be as far down the road as we are spiritually or as far down the road as we think we are spiritually, right? Folks, it it would be tragic to have a form of godliness but deny the power of it. A tragic thing it would be to present a falsity on the outside while secretly and inwardly there's something much different. I caution you, I caution myself to understand that it is possible to grieve the Savior because of the inward condition of the heart, yet be very respectable to others by a false exterior. You know, it is possible to be a Bible reader, to be a self-professed Bible expert, to be a Bible teacher and impress everyone with our outward show of knowledge and religion, yet be actually far from God, right? Perhaps you have noted recently my appeal to us as a church that we genuinely respond to the Word of God and the Spirit of God after hearing preaching and teaching from God's Word. And this is why, folks. And and I don't know that um, what we used to do 30 years ago was all that helpful, but we used to give what I'll call come-forward invitations. You know what, folks? I think that was overdone, and I think there were high-pressure sales on pastor's sermons. But folks, we need to respond to the Word of God, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God when we hear it. Because when we don't, our hearts become hardened. How do you know, Pastor Rob? Because I've seen it in my own life. And I'm not saying you have to run down an aisle, beat your chest, come down here, lay prostrate on the floor, and and do that. But folks, we must always, you will, you will always respond to preaching and teaching when you hear it. And one of the responses may be not responding to it. And you've heard me say this before, and I'll keep saying it because it's so true. What God does in my heart in the preparation of a sermon I mean, there are times when I stop preparing a sermon and I just bow my head and close my eyes and say, God, forgive me for not measuring up to where I need to be. And thank You for Your Word exposing this in my life. We, we, we must respond. It, it is a dangerous thing to be brought to the verge of repentance and then turn away. It's a dangerous thing. It's too easy for us to be clear of gross sin, yet guilty of what might be more respectable sins. <laughs> Have you read that book, Respectable Sins? It's the sins that we as Christians, uh, we don't really even see them as sin. And we're, we, see, we see the sin, we see the gross sins of unbelievers, but we don't see the sins of frustration, discontentment. Those are sins. It's too easy to guard yourself from the sins you disapprove of, but secretly indulge in the ones you love. Do you understand what I mean by that? May we also take note that hardness of heart doesn't happen overnight, but it's thickened little by little as we allow and justify the little sins. And as the Apostle Paul did, we are to 
exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Folks, there are all kinds of people in the church. What kind are you? Charles Spurgeon spoke of those who had the habit of caviling. Now, I had to, I had to look that word up. Uh, it means to make petty or unnecessary objections. There are those who just love to contradict. Right? Oh, they love pointing out uh, what they perceive as being done wrong or said wrong. And, and it's this nitpicking, my mother used to call it. And, and constantly needing to show people that, that they, they messed up. They made a mistake. They, they slipped up. They love to correct others. And Spurgeon said, while others are stuck, struck while others are struck by the beauty of the Word and the Gospel preached, these types of people only remember the mispronunciation made by the preacher. These are those who are not looking to be convicted by Scripture, but they're critics of the message and they're critics of the messenger. And I thought, if Charles Spurgeon is saying that, who is this tremendous orator, but I think if I've been reading, you can probably figure this out. I've been reading uh, Spurgeon's sermons on the Gospels, and uh, although yes, he painted beautiful word pictures. You know, his messages were very simple messages, and the appeals were very simple appeals. And so he says uh, that these are those who are not looking to be convicted by Scripture, but they're critics. You know what he said about that? He said, any fool can do that, but only a fool will do that. Uh, I've been around uh, seminary-educated pastors that go to conferences, and they're sitting there, and afterwards they're critiquing the message of the guy that was up there. And I want to say, did, did you listen to see what God would have for you? Or are you just now gotten to this point where I've risen to this, this level of education and I'm an expert on everything. Not only the message, but the delivery. Well, I hope we don't sit in the seat and be critics. I hope we sit. Yes, be, be critique if you hear false doctrine. If there's an error on the doctrine. But, um, boy, any fool can do this, says Spurgeon. And he spoke of those who give themselves the air of literary men. They are not, he says, like commonplace hearers. They require something more intellectual. You know, Pastor Spurgeon, we need something that appeals more to our intellect. No, you need your heart to be softened by the Word of God. That's what you need. That's what I need. He said, he said, pride of this sort ruins those who indulge it. To be unbelieving in order to show one's superiority is an unsatisfactory business. Let us all be careful to keep away from hardening influences. <clears throat> Excuse me, influences. Choose to leave anything that could steal your heart from true spirituality. So folks, you decide what that is for you. I know what it is in my life to choose to leave anything that could steal my heart from true spirituality. Even if those things in and of themselves are not sinful. Don't allow anything to hinder your relationship with God. Root out anything that will take you from prayer in your time with God and His Word. And eliminate anything that dampens your zeal for the Gospel and the telling of it to others. Eliminate any amusement that lessens your hatred of sin and any influence that clouds your view of God. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand with sinners or sit with the scornful. Do not allow yourself to be conformed 
by this world, but delight in the Lord and pursue genuine godliness and holiness and righteousness, which, by the way, is found only in the heart of one who has complete dependence on God and submission to Him. Let's bow our heads, please, in a moment for a word of prayer. I'm asking you this morning that if the Spirit of God is working in your heart, to be responsive to the Spirit of God. Allow your heart to be made tender to the truth that we see in the Gospel this morning. Would you take just a moment there? If there's something that is pricking your heart this morning to speak with the Lord about that matter, and then I'll close us in prayer.